Get your medieval geek on with Shadowversity hoodies. Available through Teespring. Link in the description. Shadowversity. Greetings, I'm Shad, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the historical development and understanding of steel metallurgy in history. And when I do my, have done my research and you know, looked back on this subject, I've come to really appreciate that classic statement, the riddle of steel, because for the more primitive man, it really would have been quite the riddle, because they would be getting a result that they wouldn't know or understand how and why. And one of the reasons why this is the case is because as soon as you start to smelt iron, and generally you'll be smelting it with a carbon-based fuel source, whether it's charcoal or even wood or anything like that, you're actually invariably, you know, unavoidably going to be making a certain amount of steel as a byproduct without even realizing it because that carbon is going to be infused in parts of the iron. I need to just pause and interject here to explain that I'm actually speaking from an assumed understanding that many of you might not actually have. Because if your understanding of smelting is done in a crucible, then what I just said does not make sense. I'm actually speaking from an understanding of the more basic type of smelting that happened in early history. And that is when the metal ore is literally put in the bed of coals for the purpose of smelting. There are a couple of different techniques for this method, the most prominent being a bloomery furnace, which I'll explain in a little bit later. Smelting was also done in clay crucibles, but in regards to early history, they didn't have the technology to build a furnace hot enough to melt iron in those crucibles. Actual crucible steel is something that was developed much, much later. But in regards to copper and other metals that melt at a much lower temperature, well, they could be smelted in a clay crucible. So in regards to smelting a usable amount of iron from iron ore, they couldn't do this with a crucible in early history, and rather had to resort to the techniques of smelting the iron in the bed of coals itself. Now, as to you know, getting the specifically accurate, you know, uh, percentage of carbon to get the most optimal type of steel that you want, well, they would have had no idea. But the, uh, the underlying principle that I'm talking about here is that fact, as soon as you start smelting iron, basically you, you can't avoid getting steel. That's what I learned. I, and when I first started, or before I was researching this, I had the more common incorrect assumption that first, iron smelting was developed and once they got iron smelting underway then then they started to discover oh look you, you can then make this harder thing uh, with steel don't really know and then they started to perfect it and and i think this is partially correct and they start to experiment to try and figure out what they're doing to get this harder byproduct and they figure it out and then well ah, we have steel right but the assumption that steel wasn't around when you first started smelting iron is incorrect because like i said you actually can't avoid it, not if you're using a carbon-based fuel. So when finding sources of iron and they can pick it up and say, hey, this looks pretty solid, ting, ting, knock, knock. I wonder if we can melt it like we do with, you know, bronze, tin and whatever, and see if we can make useful stuff out of it. The first problem they would have found is that this is a lot harder to melt than other things. Iron has a much higher melting temperature than, say, copper. And so the big barrier in developing this technology is actually smelting technology. One of the most basic ways that they developed being able to smelt iron was in what is called a bloomery. Now, a bloomery furnace can be made in several ways. Uh, the Japanese Satara, how they get their famed tabahagane, uh, a much overlorded uh, substance because tabahagane is, is bloomery steel. Like, there's actually nothing too, you know, special about it. Uh, the only difference is, is that they f uh, knew how to pick out what was steel in the kind of lumpy mess that you get out of it. And they were able to pick out the steel uh, and then measure up the carbon content because they figured out the brightness of the material, okay? Um, iron with a higher carbon content will appear more silvery the more carbon that is put into it. And so the iron that's a bit darker is closer to pure iron. And then iron brighter, you, know, you get steel, and then you get past steel into things like pig iron and stuff like that. But the actual technological basis of what they're doing there 
It's no different to the basic bloomery furnace of the very early periods. And because yeah, they got this iron, they want to melt it. And so there's multiple ways you can build it. But essentially, you're putting the iron, whatever it is, whether it's iron, sand, or if it's bog iron, whatever, right? you're, you're putting it in part of it right in the center of fire. But you're melting this lump of steel, okay? But when I say melt, this is another misconception because I'm using melt in the more casual usage of the term because they're actually not rendering this iron into a liquid. Uh, a bloomery furnace can't get hot enough. You might be thinking, well then hang on, how are they making steel and how are they doing? Okay, they're getting it hot enough where it gets mildly, not even mildly, even a bit higher, uh, almost gelatinous might be the term, okay? It's like partially liquefied, just not fully. Enough so that carbon can be diffused into the iron, but not perfectly, and not enough for all the impurities in this iron uh, to raise to the surface. But what is interesting, because iron has a higher melting temperature, a lot of those impurities have low melting temperatures than the iron and so they will melt and seep out as molten slag and so what you have in the bottom of bloomeries is generally kind of like a, a funnel or spout at the bottom for the molten slag to seep out and then you're going to be fusing all the other parts of the iron together and then you break it open and pull out this lump of now if you're thinking you were just trying to smelt iron well they haven't rendered it into a liquid and then poured it into a mold okay they're just kind of getting rid of impurities but trying to also get it in a workable state because of course iron that's really really hot you can start to hit it pound it into a shape and so they pull it out of the bloomery and they start to hammer it to knock and weld all those different elements and chunks together into a bloom. And like I've already said, but I'm going to repeat it because this is the important point, you can't avoid making certain parts of that iron into steel in the process. Now when they first did that, they probably had no clue. They were just trying to make this hard, you know, rocky kind of substance that they found in the hills or whatever into a more workable state and they already knew the concept of smelting. So yeah, we'll try it with this and they're beating it and they work it into shape and they have iron tools. And well, look at that, we're in the Iron Age. Yet it would have been really interesting to kind of watch uh, people's small discoveries uh, when they start working with iron because they, uh, you know, they're trying to melt it or at least they're heating up really hot and they, then they melt away the slag and stuff and then they beat it into this lump and you have this bloom and they're looking at this bloom. They'll note it, they'll clearly notice that, oh, would you look at that? Some of these lumpy sections are a bit brighter than other lumpy sections, especially if you try to scrape away the crap at the top, oxidization I'm referring to, and had a real close look at the different levels of brightness. Um, that might have hit onto them, but especially in working, they would invariably discover that p portions of this bloom is actually a lot harder than other portions. And then that's not a, you know, a difficult leap for them to realize, well, something that is stronger and harder May, will make something that'll last longer, better tools, better weapons, than not. And so this is where I think we would start to see the first emergence of steel in not only like weapons and tools, but even jewelry. In fact, the earliest, you know, on record find that we have of actual carburized, so, you know, ten, I think it's even been tempered correctly, steel is around 3000 BC. So that's really early on. But we're not even at the, uh, you know, <laughs> this is why it's the riddle. There's so many elements to it. We're not even at the quenching and tempering phase. Now I've done a whole video on quenching and tempering. I encourage you to watch it if you want to know what's going on there. But we're not even there yet, okay? They're just, they're, they're just not even understanding the concept of carbon per percentage, the amount of carbon in this iron. But they would be able to figure out this is harder than not. Interesting. And then the next stage is also quite intuitive. Okay, this stuff is harder. Well, once we make this bro uh, bloom, let's break it apart. Let's get, get a hammer to it, shatter it. And I'm going to pull beside these, you know, harder bits, all right? And I'm going to keep them together. And if I, I, I can hammer them, heat them up again, hammer them together in one kind of more solid lump and work them into a shape, well, then that would be the very first steel tools or whatever ever made. They'd have no idea what they've done. All they know is that we melted this stuff, iron or whatever, and then we get different types, the harder types or not harder types. Don't even know what's going on, but cool, hard. Take it aside, let's use that for something special. Then, naming this harder material as separate to this other material, iron and whatnot, also seems quite evident, intuitive, and they would name it whatever, you know, word they used for what we call steel. 
What's interesting, even without an understanding of what's going on, they are able to make it, but they have no real control over the quantity, okay? It's just kind of like a shotgun spray whenever they're smelting iron, and then they can pull aside whatever happened to result into this higher quality material, which would make this higher quality material much more valuable, all right? Because they don't know how they're making it, they just know it's a byproduct that's happening, which would indeed make it Precious, precious materials. What do you make precious materials out of? Well, generally, you make jewelry out of it to show how wealthy you are. And the earliest, you know, archaeological artifacts we have that are made out of steel are bits of jewelry. Makes sense. So it's starting to fit together. I can see what's happening here. Regarding the earliest time that steel was employed in weaponry, specifically swords, I like swords, they're my favourite weapon, of course, I have made a whole video on it uh, called the Vera Jericho Sword. Another great companion video to this subject here. Though it turns out the Vera Jericho Sword might not be the earliest steel sword we have on record. I'm doing some research into another video where I might be able to explore another sword made out of steel. Uh, that even predates it, and it's a type of copus. But the reason why I'm bringing up the Vera Jericho sword is that there's a very interesting way that it was made because, like I mentioned in the video itself, it's not all steel, okay? I said in the video it was a forge welded composite of iron and steel. But upon further research, finding better sources, referencing, because it, it was hard to find information on that sword, I actually found the original source of where this information comes from, and it's actually the uh, uh, museum journal, and I was like in the 19-somethings, where they did like microscopic analysis of the blade and stuff like that, and what they actually found, okay, is that the sword was made up of three parts, but that's only if you lump the two ridges together, so there's two ridges, so essentially it's four parts. You have the blade. The blade is specifically mild steel. That's important. That's not what we would call high carbon steel, but absolutely what we would call steel. And mild steel is a lot stronger than regular iron. Very important, very precious, and probably very valuable. So much so that they understood the difference in its properties. Because the other parts of the sword are made out of iron, and are specifically different, okay? And it's consistent. The sword is consistent mild steel, but the ridges, they were forge welded onto the blade, they're made out of iron, and the hilt also made out of iron. This is significant because it, it shows very clearly that whoever made this sword understood the difference in the properties and performances of these materials. And mild steel makes for a better blade, and a sharper blade that'll hold its edge longer, much more than iron does. So much so, that he used all the material he had, okay, all the mild steel he had only for the blade. This is the good stuff, okay? And so, as much of the material as I can get, maybe it's all he had, bang, into the blade because he didn't have enough to waste on the other parts, and he, perhaps he didn't have enough. And so he needs to finish off the sword, and there are other parts of the sword that don't need to be nearly as hard or strong as the blade, like the ridges, though the, it would have helped if the ridges were made out of, um, you know, mild steel or any steel. And the handle, and the handle, you know, as long as it, it's connected, it's strong, and it won't, you know, break off, that's fine and that was made out of iron as well. Now we don't know when people started to develop a more sophisticated understanding of how to make steel, whether it was more hit and miss for a very long time, and in regards to when the Vera Jericho sword was made, it dates to about 600 BC, we don't even know in this time, okay? So the steel that the blade was made out of could have been from uh, whatever bloomery type of technology they're using, and it's like, all right, we're pulling aside this material and we're gonna keep that together and save it until we have enough to make something useful out of it. Or they could have started to key on to the fact that, okay, can't, maybe it's, maybe if I put more coal in the fire, I get more of this uh, brighter, you know, metal. And if I put less, I get the darker metal, which is softer. So they could then try and start to manipulate carbon content without really realizing this is what they're doing. They just know, oh, look at this, we're getting this result. I mean, in Rome, they actually thought at one point that it was red hair, like, I haven't double checked this. I've got working off, you know, anecdotal information that I saw in a documentary ages ago, and it's only come to my mind now, so I haven't been able to double check it, but so double check me on this one. But I remember in a documentary that they actually believed uh, what, in, in certain parts in Rome, what created steel was red haired boys urinating on the furnace during the smelting process. Take from that what you will, but I think it's interesting if there's any, uh, you know, credibility to that account. I think it's interesting to show that 
they didn't know how this was done, okay? They, they, they're attributing the result to random things that are happening. Maybe it was someone peeing on it. Maybe that's giving us his better stuff. Who knows, right? But there's like experimentation and they're trying to figure out what happens and clearly they eventually figured it out much later. But we have this large period of time where steel production was this interesting mystery that was always happening. We're always getting these portions of steel in, in you know, iron production, but we don't know what it's making. It's a riddle, a mystery, but we'll figure it out someday. And of course, someday we, humanity, we did figure it out. And not only that, then we took it a bit further and then we figured out, oh, quenching it affects the properties even more so. And it becomes more of a riddle, more of an interesting thing, but produces even more excellent quality materials to make stuff out of. So one of these days, if I'm ever, you know, running a role-playing game, a fantasy, whatever, writing a story and stuff like that, part of me would really like to run a setting where the, uh, the mystery of steel was still a mystery, but it was there, okay? It was this magical kind of stuff that's just appearing in the smelting process, sometimes in more quantity, sometimes in less, but this is precious. This is almost as valuable as gold. We're pulling this aside, and you, my son, the swords we make out of this, will be stronger than all other swords that could, uh, it could cleft an iron sword in two. That's probably an over-exaggeration, but uh, it could be close. That, well, seriously, a, a steel sword against an iron sword? Which one's gonna come out better? Steel every day. So yes, the wonderful mystery and riddle of steel. And just trying to think about how people would have thought of it, reacted and observed and learnt about it throughout history. Thank you for watching, I hope you've enjoyed, and I do hope to see you again. Until that time,